Yeah, so I'm a, a postdoc researcher in, uh, in the Swedish University of Agriculture Science in far in the north in Sweden. And uh, as introduced, uh, my talk is about uh, uh, open source tools in, in life science and uh, an example where I started to work with this stuff, this is in uh, imaging mass spectrometry. So my talk will be quite a bit uh, non-IT stuff, just to give you a, an idea of where, where those things could meet and where there would be possibility for further open source projects where certainly a lot of uh, scientists, which usually maybe don't have so much to do with IT otherwise, would uh, have benefit if, if people help with, uh, with their knowledge in, in IT to, to make tools for uh, advancing it, in, uh, for example, in life sciences. So my background is, uh, is chemistry and biology. I work, as I said, in the Agriculture University in Sweden. Sweden has a lot of forest. Uh, forest is a very important business in Sweden. So trees, we use them to make paper. Recently, we use it to make biofuels. We use to make new materials, all kind of stuff. Uh, the idea how this should work in the future is that we want to be able to make trees that are genetically modified, so the actual physical material, the wood, the material that we use for the products, that we can uh, kind of uh, render it uh, more usable for the different applications. This could be, for example, in uh, pulp and paper. Uh, if you want to make paper from wood, usually you need a lot of chemicals to extract the cellulose, which is this part of the wood, which is, interest, uh, which is of interest to make the paper. So you need a lot of energy and chemicals to extract those molecules. And uh, if we could uh, change by, by making uh, transgenic trees and change the chemistry of the actual wood, we could also make the, the economy work better in terms that it gets cheaper and, and less, uh, uh, less dirty to, to, for example, produce paper. And this applies basically for all those different applications that we could do with, uh, with raw materials. So we are working on wood, but this is basically true for all kind of other biological raw materials also. You can use uh, transgenic technology to uh, change the actual physical chemical properties so that it gets more usable. And this is not just something which is like future stuff which we maybe can do in 10 years. This is stuff which is really done. So there are uh, trees in, in, uh, in planta plantage trees which are used already, let's say in Brazil or even in, in China where, where you plant those and where, where you can get a better economy on pulp and paper. Now, here this is just a, a little bit of a background uh, from a biological point of view, what was needed to make this available. Of course, you need the genome of those uh, species you want to modify in terms of uh, the trees we work with, Populus trichocarpa. This was done in 2006, where we got uh, the whole genome published uh, openly accessible for everybody. So you can go into the database and look up all the gene sequences and which genes are there, what they are doing, and so on. Uh, if you have the genome sequence of a species, what you usually would do then is uh, genetic screens, mutant screens, where you usually randomly mutate those species and look for properties that you're interested. This would be the, the, the mutant screen. You grow those species then and uh, transform them to those, new, to those new genomes, to those modified versions, and, and select those that are of interest. This is a, sort of a daily business, what we are doing in the research institute. So we are doing those mutant screens and growing the new modified trees and then uh, where I come in as a chemist, I start to look at the wood, at the chemical properties of the wood, if we achieved what we want or if we're doing that randomly, also to just characterize the wood, what is different, what, what has happened during this genetic modification. 
And what we call this is phenotyping or chemotyping. It's basically looking at the very molecular structure of the wood and getting an idea what has happened and try to link that to the genes that we were modifying, figure out the function of the genes and, and uh, get an idea how we could use that in, in uh, producing other raw materials. Now, uh, chemotyping, this is where the speciality technique that I work with, which is called TOF-SIMS, that's a time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry. This is a technique which was used since quite some time in uh, mostly in, in uh, semiconductor uh, industry actually for imaging of the, of the silica wafer to, to look for mostly uh, quality assurance. But recently, so this technique was then also uh, modified that it could be used in, in uh, biological tissues. What the whole technique is about uh, is that we use an iron gun and shoot with this iron gun at the solid matter. Uh, so you could see here the solid matter, here the primary particles. We shoot at the, at the, at the solid. In my case, that would be wood tissue or plant tissue. And you get then sputter molecules which fly out of the, of the actual material. And those are then, so to say, sucked up in a mass spectrometer. And in a, a mass spectrometer, you could say, is nothing else than a, a balance for molecules, which you measure the weight of the molecules. And by the weight, you can kind of identify which molecule that was. Hence, you know the chemistry of this, of this uh, solid that you're uh, investigating. Uh, the way this is done is by uh, magnetic force, so you use uh, the magnetic force to kind of uh, put those molecules on a, on a certain flying path and just those with a certain weight fly then into the detector here and by this you know the, the weight of them. Now the tof sims experiment, a bit more visual, you have the ion gun, you have the sample down here and the time of flight analyzer, that is the, the mass spectrometry analyzer that we use. Here you can see some picture of such equipment. Uh, the lower picture would be the, the actual sample chamber where you, this is in, in, in vacuum, where you put thin slices of your sample onto the sample stage and what you can see here, those probes, these are the, the ion cannons and uh, straight up, that would be the entrance then to the mass spectrometer. Now, the special thing about imaging mass spectrometry is that you're not just looking at molecules uh, in a liquid or in a solid, but you can do that spatially resolved. And this is a, spe a special thing about this time of uh, flight of this secondary ion mass spectrometry, that you actually come to a very high resolution. So you can analyze your samples down to the nanometer regime, which is very special in mass spectrometry. Usually you would come down maybe to, to micrometer. And this is where it gets interesting because you come down to, a, to a, a size region where you actually can look into single cell walls. You can look uh, how they are built, which molecules are there, how are they interlinking the different molecules, and, what, and, and you can do that actually visually, so you will get nice pictures where you uh, can, can dig deeper, then those pictures are, are so to say, hyperspectral, so you can dig down and, and, and get a lot of information about uh, the chemical build of, of, the, of each point here. Now the problem, such machines, this is uh, multi-million dollar equipment. Usually there's not even at every university you have one of those, it's quite a specific equipment. Uh, for me as a researcher, I'm currently a postdoc researcher, so I go to a university, I propose my experiments, I do my experiments on the machine, I get there, I cannot really, it's not me buying the machine, so I'm kind of reliant that I can usefully make, make use of those machines that are there. Now, as I said, those machines were mostly used in, uh, in uh, semiconductor industry. Uh, all the software which is available is usually closed source and is also mostly made for the applications for, for the industry and not really for, 
those few machines that are standing in universities and are used for life science, this is still a very new field. So it's not, it's not the same quantity as a uh, semiconductor industry is buying. So the problem is we don't have software and, and the data that we get is closed source. So the first thing I had to do was kind of uh, reverse engineering data formats and, and starting to make them toolboxes so that we can uh, use this data and, and work with it as it would be any other mass spectrometry data. Mass spectrometry otherwise is very common in universities. It's a, it's a very usual technique, but uh, this specific type here so is not very often used, so therefore there were no tools available. Uh, and this is where, uh, where the whole open source idea comes in. So in, in, in life science, we often use uh, uh, the language R. There's uh, for, for bioinformatics a very nice repository, bioconductor, with a, a lot of uh, open source software. So I started to, to make this uh, tool to first uh, read those files from, from this TOF Sims machine and then also uh, process it and analyze it and even export it to other formats so that you could use it with other tools that are already available. Uh, the reason why I choose R1 of course is because there's the whole uh, uh, repository bioconductor which is a lot of bioinformatics software but then also is uh, rather easy and quick to, to make your tools and then it has very good uh, uh, interfaces also to C++ as soon as you come to image processing and image analysis is of course useful to, to have access to, to a bit faster programming languages than, than a, a scripting language. Uh, the software is now uh, openly available on this uh, bioconductor uh, repository. So it's maybe not of too big interest for people like you working with IT, but just to say this is kind of a project that went on in about three, four years and finally we got the first version out and now we're of course looking to improve and looking to, to add new functionality and also to uh, get people using it to, to get publications out where, where people actually work on this. Just uh, some small examples with what this is about. So we, we record the images. Often this is about very basic imaging processing things. As I said, we have an extremely high spatial resolution down to nanometers. The problem you end up with often is uh, when you think of a tree, when you think of wood, it's quite big chunks of material. If you analyze in the, in the nanometer regime, to get really reprodu reproducible results, you need to take a lot of samples. So that can be for one tree, you need maybe thousand sampling points. Uh, if you work with uh, genetic trees, you need maybe from one genetic line three to four different trees that you need to resample. So we end up with gigabytes of data and you need to be able to automatize those things. So image processing in the very simplest form is often that you need to do some thresholding, some object detection that you can first take away this data which you not interested in to then have the, the, the rest data that you're actually going to do your analysis on. Often analysis and image analysis with uh, mass spectrometry is a multivariate analysis like principal component analysis to, to find uh, those parts in the spectra which are of interest to then again segment further uh, as we were doing here where we basically do some background uh, detection and then removing the background. This was done with uh, principal component analysis where you can see that uh, compared to the first Im image where we have some artifacts here in the, in the vessel uh, holes which we with principal component analysis can easily remove and then can go to a black and white mask to, to uh, extract those data points which we are interested in. That's basically what I have to show you, uh, acknowledgements to the institutes where I worked. Uh, that was in, at the Chalmers University in Gothenburg. Uh, a little thing which I maybe can spend two minutes talking about. Uh, this project, a lot of the programming was done in a collaboration with a Vietnamese uh, outsource, IT outsourcing company. 
which was interested in, in doing R&D also in the open source field. And this is this uh, TMA company, it's in Vietnam a rather big company. So they uh, spend quite some money and resources, help me with people, uh, especially in the, for the C++ programming, where I could tell them what I need and they would deliver that. Uh, that was a really helpful thing and was sort of also a international open source collaboration which, which opened quite a, a lot of doors both for them and for me for, for doing things which I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. And a lot of for, uh, funding I got from the Swedish Research Council and Bio for Energy is a, a program in Sweden where we're looking into how we could use the resources, the bioresources we have in Sweden in, in other ways to create more and other high value products besides just the uh, pulp and paper or biofuels where we try to, to develop new uh, raw material, new products which, which create higher value than just uh, making paper. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe some questions? Uh, so my interpretation of where open source has been an effective uh, development approach has been situations where there are people who are both interested and programmers right. uh, involved. Uh, to what extent is that true of life science researchers? Yeah, I, I think in, in, in biology, uh, in certain fields, it's quite okay actually, uh, especially in the uh, sequencing field. I think a lot of biologists, they are trained to use uh, bioinformatics tools, which are often, I think there's a lot of uh, Python toolboxes people use, uh, a lot of people use R. So I think the, the affinity to IT is, is, is quite high actually, and people are open to use it. But as soon as it comes down to, to make solid tools, which you, when you have a lot of data processing involved, when, when things should be clean written and stable and fast, and you actually need people to help. Yeah, I mean, yeah a lot of things start as really dodgy prototypes, <laughs> and then get improved. In fact, almost everything starts that way. It gets improved over time. Sure, yeah, sure. I, I'm, I have a different exposure to this with environmental monitoring, where I do stuff in the open. Right. Data in an area that's very touchy in Singapore, and have certainly had contact with the environment agency. And it's clear that it's not actually any displeasure at all. It's just that for them, they are environmental scientists, and IT are those somewhat uncooperative people down the hall. Yeah. <laughs> that they would rather not deal with if they could possibly avoid it. And so yeah. Getting, in that case, which is getting data out was the problem. Yeah, I think in generally in, in biology, the, the advantage is that you have the field of bioinformatics, which is rather big. Uh, bioinformatics is, I think, is a a lot of open source activity going on. Most of the projects, I mean, uh, are by definition, the funding is from the state, so the results have to be published, the results have to be open. And uh, it's, I would say nowadays, it's kind of, if you apply for money, you need to disclose that you will uh, give the, the, the source code to, to the public and that it will be open source. So this is actually, I think, on the good way. It's going slow, but it's on the good way, I think. Yeah, definitely. Is that that's Sweden, Europe? How wide is that sort of pressure to have grant money be pushed into open source rather than closed software to the extent that that was required? You mean research-wise or, or? Yeah. So I mean, grant bodies increasingly saying, firstly, you've got to use preprint archives. Yeah, at, at least for for me, the those grants are I apply now not directly related to software, but in general, let's say. Uh, Open, open journal. Uh, by those grants that I apply, I'm, I'm forced to, or forced, I mean, I have no problem with that, to, to publish in, in, in open journals that the results that I find that they are available to everybody. So uh, a part of my research budget goes to paying the money to, to publish in, in uh, open journals, which I think is great. I mean, it's a, whether it's a good idea that you need to pay to publish uh, in open journals is another question, but basically that you have to do that, I mean, that the results get open, I think is, is very important. And especially in, in, in those cases also, 
uh, with those machines. I mean, there's a lot of data out there available. You can just download it. But what is the what is the help if it's in a closed format? So all those tools, they also need to be available, of course. If you can download experimental data, but you cannot use it because it's in, a, in, in some weird format, that, that doesn't really help. And, and there, maybe, it's not. Well, this, this point that you had a difficulty in particular with this approach. Yeah. Uh, silicon tabs are famously secretive. Yeah, the yeah. The man in the silicon I'm aware of can't publish his designs. Right. Because the connector pad uh, templates are disclosed under NDA. So you, can't, you, can't, you can do the rest of your silicon. Yeah. But you can't publish the bits where you put the bonding wires. Right. And so if you've got a technique that's largely used inside silicon tabs. Yeah, I guess those companies selling those machines, they're used to a completely different business. So they're. Uh, so it's not, yeah, it doesn't have to be a, a problem for them to solve so much as you've just got a bit of a. Yeah, it's actually also, not, it's, it's maybe three companies in the whole world producing this machine. I was, uh, when I, I did postdoc in Japan where one of the companies is and I was at the lab there and more or less tried to convince them to kind of open up the, the data format. But, um, well, Japan is probably another story then that it's difficult to get to talk to the right people to, to do such stuff. But there was, yeah, there was no real interest in doing that. And users of the data? Yeah, it's general plants. It's are not just wood. Yeah. Entirely different fields where people are using similar equipment. Uh, now, this very specific technique, as I said, is, is rather is rather unique. There's not too many universities who actually have it. It's it's, uh, it's getting momentum now. It's often uh, having very high spa spatial resolution is of is of big interest. Of course, you can. In, in bioscience, as soon as you can start to look in single cells, you can, you can look what's happening in one single specific cell. It gets really interesting. And this is where, where this technique probably in the future will, will grow much more. And then I hope that with some sort of a starting point software-wise where people can start to build upon also to, yeah, to work on the data. And uh, as long as it's so expensive to have such machines, you maybe don't want to have the machine at your university, but you just go somewhere, do the experiments. And at the moment, you could not even uh, look at your data at home because even the software, you need to pay for licenses. So now when you have those toolboxes, you can at least kind of take your, so your uh, data home and work at home with, with, uh, with your results. So this is kind of the, that was my idea, which I even needed that for me because I, as a postdoc, you're just traveling around and working here and there and <laughs> cannot really bring with you the software. No, that's fantastic. I get the, I get the approach. Mm -hmm. All right, well, before you talk. Thank you. Any other questions at all? Oh. Have you started work on reverse engineering in any of these proprietary formats? Yeah, yeah. It's actually. <laughs> Let's say in the, uh, there's, uh, as I said, there's three commonly used machines, one from Germany, one from Japan, and, and one from France. And the, the one from Japan, I think as long as we keep it rather low, they don't know probably about the software package, but yeah, it's proprietary format. And uh, it's, it's reverse engineered, but it seems to work. I have to admit, I didn't spend too much time uh, scratching my head about uh, legal consequences, but it works. There, there shouldn't be any legal consequences. You've uh, just reverse engineered yeah. the format. I mean, you, 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 have, you have not been given any information under NDA. No. You've done it publicly. No. Uh, hang on. Did you, did you look at any documentation from the, from the suppliers? Do you, the, diff the difficulty is going to be that the institution has signed an NDA and your agreements, where they are, honor those NDAs. So if you've looked at documentation provided by the manufacturer, then you may have No, this I don't have. I, it's really, I mean, I got the files and I, yeah, we, we, we worked it out you by ourselves. No problem. Good. Mm. Yeah, you <laughs> okay, so I'm safe. Good to know. If you look at any, like, from India, you would have gotten attention. So, thank you very much. Thank you.